uh, very fortunate to have such amazing friends uh, through this community that we have here in, uh, in Versa and globally around the world. Um, this was actually my first case that I ever used the Densiburs on. And it was kind of an eye-opening case for me because I was quite shocked at what was actually happening. I didn't even know, but I was doing an unintentional sinus bump. Had no clue. I was just demoing the birds. We were videoing it just to try to get Salah some footage. And unintentionally, after using a few of the birds, I ended up elevating the sinus almost two to three millimeters, and I was able to place a longer implant. Had no clue. This is the oldest case I have on record. I met Salah um, in the ICOI meeting in um, 2000, I guess 15, when we, his first booth that he had there. And he had convinced me. The words that he was using, bone plasticity, uh, they were the fact that we were densifying the bone, not eliminating the bone. These were words that sat well with me. This is what I've been trying to practice my whole career, minimalizing the effect to the patient, not having overly stressing the patient, the stress versus strain relationship, understanding the philosophy behind that. And this worked quite beautifully, and I was actually able to throw away a lot of the ISQ concepts that I had learned because I was always worried about this dip in the bone that, that after the implant was integrating in that, that third to fourth week, which I no longer was seeing anymore. So it was a true uh, compliment to that. So from this case, I was really honored that it worked out wonderfully, that I was able to present it. And so this is the oldest case I have on record. It's about four years old. And as you can see, it's holding quite nicely. The bone level is still quite excellent after four years. I say, they say the hallmark is seven years for the body to turn over. So we're going to have to wait another couple of years. And at the next symposium, I'll show this again. And I guarantee, I would feel very confident that this bone level will still be in the exact same spot because of the confidence that I have in watching the bone me mechanism that's actually occurring when we're using these denser burrs. This was the first time that uh, I was honored to speak. Uh, Fred was there. He told me I looked very handsome that day. Today he told me I wasn't looking so good. <laughs> but it was, I was honored to be on stage at that point and uh, actually introduce it to the AID community. It was truly wonderful. We did a hands-on workshop with others that are still here in the crowd. So you can see the people that started are still here. That tells you something about the company. And it also tells you something about the community that's been growing. That was the first Versa booth at the ICOI. And it just kept growing and growing to where we were adding more and more key opinion leaders, truly remarkable, really incredible speakers. I mean, look who's on stage here. I'm just a regular general practitioner. But look who's been on stage so far, and look who else is coming the rest of the day. It's truly, truly impressive. I mean, our moderator is Jorge Campos. That's remarkable. It's just remarkable. So it's all thankful to that, and it all culminated uh, two years ago when we had the osteodensification meeting in Orlando. And oh, I'm sorry, I just want to do that again, because, because of that, that meeting, uh, from there, you, you're able to see what type of an organization that Versa became. And that osteodensification meeting went well, extremely well. And this one, even more so. And it's all thanks to Salah, because it all starts at the top. And I know this because I have no hair, just like you. It does all start at the top. It doesn't matter how much hair you have. It goes from the top, and then it goes down. The hair goes down, too. <laughs> but it doesn't remain up here. So it's been truly remarkable. It's been an amazing ride. And we've even got to do these, my partner and I, Scott Gans, at our educational um, uh, institutes that we have in Tijuana and Puebla and now in Cancun, soon in Arizona, hopefully in the near future. We've been able to do that and use these in our courses. We've exposed so many people through the courses over the last four years to use osteodensification. They've then been encouraged to go and take these courses with Salah and with Ziv and others. A lot of them are actually here today, and it's truly Humbling to be a part of this entire experience that we have going on here. I think I'm going to switch remotes. But during these, uh, these meetings that we have, we, uh, we learn a lot. And uh, I always learn a lot. And I've learned a lot from uh, Scott Gans. And, and there's some saying that he has quite often 
He says there's two, two pra- things that he will not practice with, two technologies he will not practice without in his practice. One being Combium CT, because you don't know what you don't know. And opening up and just saying, let's see what's in there does not work. And the other is RFA or ISQ, radio frequency analysis, implant stability quotient. Knowing when the implant is stable and when it is ready. So this was a quote from Michael Norton at the Ostel meeting. And you read it very carefully. Torque is a static measurement at placement, and we need to monitor the biological dynamic process called osseointegration, which is very well said, because there's a lot of bone movement going on when we place in and we start to violate some of these, these areas. We're coming in, we're, we're drilling bone, and we're putting force on it, and we have to wait for it to remodel. An even better way that Scott Gans quoted uh, about f- five years ago was that torque, torque, is that frictional resistance of the implant as it enters the osteoman at that moment in time, but only at that moment in time, that primary initial torque. So how else could we monitor an implant's process, its progress, with, without another instrument such as Ostel ISQ? So having this RFA technology is essential into my practice, and we use it on every case, every day. And so as the, the famous quote that Scott always says is, do you ISQ? And yes, I do ISQ, and I hope you do too. The other part is that cone beams, right? 3D technology. We look at Prince William here. It doesn't look like he's being very kind to the people that are around him in the audience. But when we look at it, it's perception versus reality. Now, on, on CNN, that might look like one way. On Fox News, it might look like another. I mean, you can go figure out which one you like better. So it's quite interesting. So it's the same thing. Three-dimensional planning is the reality. That's what we're seeing. So we need to have these tools in our practices. Otherwise, what are we planning? And it's essential in trying to plan a lot of these cases as we do for osteodensification, but it also gives us a lot more information. We can take this data set and we can move it around into other softwares and we can come up with surgical guides and we can come up with solutions for either immediate type of solutions or something a little bit more delayed. And the technology is incredible. I mean, to think about it, starting with design and 3D printers, I mean, how many 3D printers can you have on the market? Come to IDS Cologne this year. Well, just go to Richard Martin's office and you'll see exactly how many 3D printers there really are. It's truly, truly amazing. Being able to print and mill in your own office. I know there's a lot of CERAC users here, but there's third-party companies as well that you can do this with. So the technology is moving extremely rapidly to where we can be able to go to that same-day solution. So my topic's a little bit confusing because basically it's about my history with osteodensification and using, using this. So I'm going to share a few of my favorite techniques. So these are a few of my favorite things. So one of them is ridge splitting, which I've always been a fan of, and I'll show you how that's changed my, my, uh, my life and uh, in my practice. And I'm also going to focus on sinus augmentation and guided surgery, those three. But these are basically my daily basic uses for the birth. So we'll start with uh, ridge splitting. So just for my, your own knowledge, if you're just starting out in this, ridge splitting can be a very complicated thing. It's something that you need to develop a skill for. But to always have in mind that we should think triangular. Think of a, a base and how wide you can make from that base. So think of, for example, the Louvre and splitting the Louvre. If I was to take an example of the Louvre and draw a line down its center, I know that I can open it just as wide as that base. I can split it to be as wide. So this is a good guideline. Can you do more than that? Yeah, sure. If you're Howie Gluckman, you certainly can. You can build outside the box. You don't have to stay within. But at certain levels, you want to try to stay within. And this is my comfort zone. I know this is how far I can do. And I can do this with great success and have wonderful outcomes for my patients. And there are other reasons um, to consider for not doing rich splitting. There may be some health issues. But the presence of cancellous bone, to me, is the most paramount. How much bone do you have? You heard many of our speakers on uh, yesterday in the morning speaking about the cortical bone and not trying to expand that cortical bone. 
But when we place a cut into that cortical bone and we do have some medullary bone in between, all of a sudden we get to engage that plasticity again. And that's the buzzword that Salah always likes to talk about is making bone plastic. So we can control that by doing it. And we used to do this by taking hammers and banging them into our patients. And when you live in Brooklyn, like I do, that's not such a good thing. Don't take a hammer to your patient because they usually have a knife. And they'll, they'll, they'll stick it right in you. You're sticking a chisel in the blade. They have no qualms about it. I can introduce you to some of my mafia friends. They're, they're not so loving of the hammers. So we drop the hammers in our practice and everything that we do. So let's take this. This is a, a case, one of my oldest cases that I did. Um, and it's, a, it's a Marie. And she's a bus driver that saved up all her money to go and do this uh, case, get her teeth for her wedding. So it was a... Uh, I had to do this right, but I also didn't have a lot of time because she was getting married in about six months. So it wasn't a lot, a lot of uh, choices to do. So we had to try to get implants at the same time. So we had that centered ridge, ridge crest. We have that triangular type of a shape. And we can take this formula for making the bone more plastic that Salah has um, graciously shared with us. And we can enter that trying to get into that plastic region. And we can open a flap, making sure to do careful dissections, is quite important, making some vertical release so we can actually see what we're doing. And once we open the flap, stretching, when you're working in the lower, which is primarily where I'm going to do ridge splitting, you like to stretch that lower region. Try to stretch out the mylar hyoid muscles so you'll be able to get tension-free closure, or at least place the tension in a separate area. I don't know that there's actually tension-free closure, but to move that around. And you know, if you follow Mike Picos and his uh, technique of placing the finger to release the myelohyde muscles, another great way to do this, which you can see on his videos, which I've watched several times over and over again. And then I realize my fingers are much fatter than yours, Mike. Sorry, it doesn't go down there. <laughs> so I have to use instruments. But using these piezo-surgery instruments to make cuts to where the blade of the saw tip will move like a pendulum. It will swing back and forth. You see how fast it can move. No bony tags remaining between the plates to where we can make these cuts. We don't have to file down this bone. It's about preserving the bone. And Chuck will speak to you about the spot protocol, saving bone. You know, this is something that we've really tried to, to do, is not to eliminate the bone whenever possible. And using the denser bones at high, denser burrs at high speeds to be able to make that bone more plastic, make that bone more flexible. And then, after using a series of the denser burrs, going in between each site and using them, we can eventually go towards implant placement. And when we think about implant placement itself, we have to think about using an implant that has the right design for this. Straight-walled implants are not ideal for this. We want to be able to use more tapered type of implants. So we have to try to pick an implant that's going to be a slightly more aggressive, that's going to have an apical tip, that's going to match our denser burrs in, in their type of shape as well. And I think this is the last set of drills, and then you'll see the implant starting to go in. But you can see how we're, we're expanding the bone. And no, notice how the bone's becoming more plasticized by doing that. So we're starting to expand that. You're seeing the osteotomies, but we're not removing the bone. And the implants will start to go in and watch as the bone starts to expand using a more tapered, aggressive implant. So this is ideal for this. Now, you don't want to place these in at too high of torque. And of course, as yesterday, I was saying 100 newtons. That would be really a little bit beyond my max for these. I like to place them in as as hard as they'll go in, but then maybe back them out again and let them go back in um, a little bit, little bit lighter. So if they go too high on the torque, I'm putting too much strain, and we don't want that stress versus strain relationship to be an issue. But you can see how we teeter-totter between the implants, go from the front one maybe to the middle, then to the back, and keep moving along the lines there until we can submerge the implant. So having a tapered implant with a tapered collar and you'll have fantastic ISQs on these cases. We're getting a, a lot of these bicortical uh, fixations here. So it's really a great technique. Look at these numbers, 84, 74, 76. These are great numbers to start off with with our implants. And then it's a matter of grafting as well. We do like to place graft on top of this. We, we do want to account for that. Uh, we're putting the bone through a lot of remodeling. So this is the other side of the mouth on the the left side, and we're doing the same thing here. And you can see that these implants actually start out very, very high. And then we go to them slowly to manipulate the bone. We don't just ram it in. If we ram it in, we're just putting too much stress on the bone. 
So at that point, I really do like to graph. If you follow the, um, the uh, Humley Wang article on the sandwich technique, uh, using that type of principle, when you have exposed implant threads, it's always good to put autogenous bone first. Well, with ridge splitting, you already have that autogenous bone surrounding your implant. So now the key is to graft around that. So how do we do that? By using, let's say, sticky type bone, or, or even adding uh, collagenous type materials to your bone to make it sticky so that it'll stay there mechanically. Otherwise, we need to use something that's more rigid to hold out our bone so that it doesn't just fall flat on us. We want the bone to be able to stay high and not lose that vertical height. So using that in a combination of PRF works for me very well, and then covering it with your choices of membrane. And at just 12 weeks later, we can see how nicely the bone is on this reconstructed CBCT. So it's working out very well. We can go and re-enter. Now the upper required expansion. And I had the same thought on this. It's, again, it's early in my career using the denser burrs that I was going to go ahead and just make the same cut. But then I decided actually not to make that cut and just use the denser burrs as Salah had taught me. I said, okay, let me try it in the maxilla. And sure enough, I, as I put it in and I did my drilling protocol, I placed the implant and you can see the bones start to stretch. It may fracture in a little bit in that area there in that corner. You notice that for a moment. But you'll, when you look at this from the occlusal view, you see that it actually didn't crack in a bad manner. It moved for me in the exact position that I actually wanted it to be. So in the maxilla, I really don't like to put these piezo cuts. I kind of just allow the bone when it's softer to do it on its own. And then yes, we do graft on top of this. We're gonna have to add more, but look how much of the expansion. We had a four millimeter ridge, yet these are four and a half millimeter implants that are going into there. So it's quite remarkable of what you can do using the combination of the right tools. And of course, grafting is a must on these cases. It's a must. So, then when we go for exposure, you can see how much gain we've had. So this is really an amazing tool for us. The combination of the two work wonderfully using the grafting together with these to actually gain what we need to. We did do some soft tissue grafting in addition. But look at these ISQ numbers. This is the key. I'm 12 weeks into the entire surgery. We did the upper, we did the lower a week later, so it's uh, you know, 11 weeks for the top, 12 weeks for the, the lower. And we're looking absolutely fantastic with our placement, and now we're going to put healing caps and start to restore. So, at the same patient, we had a, uh, a uh, tooth number seven that, was, uh, what, that needed to come out. So, of course, we went through the protocol of the, the PET, partial extraction therapy, which I've been doing now for almost six and a half years. I can't believe it's been six and a half years that I was shown this technique. And it's truly remarkable. And combining it with the denser burrs, this is, case is, again, about four years old. So combining it with denser burrs gave me a huge leg up. Because one of the issues I was having when I was doing this was preparing the root shields, and then I would start to have issues with getting good stability. Because I'd be eliminating and extracting that tooth, sometimes I'd cut the bone. But having that denser burr be able to densify that apical region for me get, started giving me these great ISQs to where I could even load the implant the same day. And that's what I really like to do, is, especially in the anterior region, is start to load these implants the same day so that I can start working on the emergence profile from day one. So osteodensification tremendously affects how we be able to do this, increasing our primary stability and our ISQs. And when we look at the reconstruct, we can see we're in that triangular bone, which Scott Gantz invented in 1795. He's that old. <laughs> He's a child prodigy. <laughs> and we was honored to publish with him and uh, with uh, Miltius Mitzias in uh, Dentistry Today. And again, we did another publication, which is a 10-year follow-up of their cases and adding our cases to it. I'm now at almost 360 cases of partial extraction therapy. I can't believe that we have that much data. It's really incredible. And you know, combining all our efforts, we're going to be coming out with a hopefully 1,000 implant paper fairly shortly. So look at this, 88. This is only six, six weeks or eight weeks later. So day of placement, 76. And I think it's eight weeks later, 88. Or nine weeks later, 88. What's that telling you? We're densifying that bone, the bone is responding, it's answering back, and it's answering back positively. 
It's extremely happy. So we load at just 11 weeks. So it's changes. Now, two and a half years later, we come back and look. Everything's still in place, bone level's still there, looking beautifully. Three and a half years later, looking great. And I had her come in last week just to take more radiographs for this, just so I can say that I'm almost at four years. We're just short of four years on the post-op with her, and the bone level's still the same. So it's not just the CEO of the company telling you that this works. This is clinical stuff in a private practice where, where we're doing this, and it works. And we all know it works now. So think triangular in these types of cases. Look for these triangular bones if you're trying to do these rich splitting cases. Think of the Louvre. Think of the pyramids. And try to expand. Graft, collagen, tension-free closure, good placement, good aggressive implant, and you'll have success, three-year post-op, using the denser burrs in this case. Same thing here, triangular bone. How many of you would just file that down and waste that bone? Let's expand that bone. Let's think of the pyramids. Expand that bone. Look how it will respond. Look at the plasticity of bone. Bone is, can become plastic if you use the right tools to plasticize it. And we can look at the post-op CBCT three months later with good growth around it. Expose, witness the bone on our own, and place healing caps and restore. And we can get great soft tissue response using the right techniques as well, like PRF and harvesting tissues. Three-year post-op of this case. Bone hasn't budged. All I used to see with rich splitting cases was bone loss, bone loss, bone loss. And it would happen very quickly. But I'm not seeing that anymore because we're not destroying the bone. So think triangular. Think of the pyramids. So this is my, my own personal study, which I'd like to publish, of showing the difference between using expanders and the densibers. So we had 19 cases using the densibers, and we had zero fractures of the labial plate. When I was using expanders and chisels and hammers, I had four cases out of the 43 that I actually had labial plate fracture. And that's the take home message for me, is to try to be more minimalized in your experiences with it. I seldom have to do vertical cuts in these cases because the bone becomes so plasticized. So let's talk a little bit about sinus augmentation. I know you've heard it before, and I can skip a lot of the details because so many of our speakers including Ziv and, and, and uh, Mike last night, and today you heard Mike Toffler today uh, speaking more about the sinus elevation about, and what we can do. But there are different types of sinuses, and you know, how do we treat them? And traditionally, yes, we've been treating them with the lateral lift. But now my lateral lift is reserved for removing things like this from the sinus. That's pretty much all I need it for. Or I have a tooth stuck in the sinus on the other side that somebody accidentally knocked in. Wasn't me and we can remove the tooth from it. Or when we have implants that somehow fall into the sinus. These are the types of cases that I reserve for lateral lifting. Otherwise, all these cases could have, that, we, that we do, typically that would have been treated with hammers, we don't do anymore. No more hammers. We can do all these types of cases using one tool, using the burr itself, the denser burr itself. And you've seen that several times. So let's take you through a case. Here's a simple case. Patient comes in, needs an extraction, fractured tooth. We're going to have to remove it, extract it. In this case, we didn't try to do an immediate. Took it a little more conservatively. We grafted it. We came back. About uh, two weeks later, this is the healing after using the PRF material. Three and a half months later, patient's ready to go. Can re-enter and start to, start to try to do our denser lift. So we take our cone beam at CBCT. We'll look at it, we'll analyze it, we'll see we have a thick schneidarian membrane. This is an easy case. It's not pathological, and it's an easy case. Nice, thick membrane, easy to do. This is, a, if you're doing your first one, this isn't the ideal, the ideal type of case to do. Nice floor, nice ridge. And we can do this, and we can use the denser burrs the same way, check to make sure that we have no perforation. When we have wide bone, the three millimeter protocol works great. When we have narrow, when we have that that wide bone with narrow, with very sh uh, shallow floor, only one or two millimeters. I like to go a little bit wider 
with my denser burrs before I start to elevate the sinus. It's because we have more pressure coming from the, the burr itself, more surface area from the burr, so it'll help bump it up a little bit easier for you. So think a little bit wider on those wide ridge cases. You're gonna probably place a wider implant anyway. Check our check x-rays, make sure that we're in the right position. And then we can use different materials. You've heard a lot about the Nova Bone. I really like the Nova Bone. It's worked great in my practice. I've been using it now for a little bit over two years and having great success with it. And then using it in this motion. And the thing about the Nova Bone that I like a lot, if you remember Salah's slide earlier yesterday showing you the hydrodynamic compression wave, well, when using the Nova Bone, if you come directly close to the sinus and you have any opening into the sinus at all, this is typically what's going to happen. And you've seen that from Ziv's lecture as well. We'll get that expansion in the sinus itself, that, that same type of wave that, that, that you had from the hydro, hydrodynamic compression wave. We'll get a compression force coming from the tips of the Nova Bone to help us continue that, that lift. It's not a hydraulic lift. It's with a, it's with a phosphosilicate material, but it's doing the job for us without having to use any secondary materials. We place our implant just following that. This is a uh, very interesting implant, uh, an Argon K3 Pro implant that I've started to use lately. It's been working really, really nicely. Nice implant, really nice design with a one and a half degree taper that I'm starting to really like. Um, so trying to diversify myself in different implants as well. Gets great ISQs, you can see here, 81 on that penguin reading. And you can see the type of elevation that we can get that you saw Michael just show this same type of stuff. And you saw Ziv show the same stuff yesterday. So controlling the soft tissue using things like PRF so we can get nice emergence profiles. And then off to the scanning phase for the, so we can get our crowns back really nicely, scanning, scan abutments in place. And we can go ahead and finish up our restorations and you can see the final results, screw retain crown. These work extremely nicely, really quickly, and we have some nice follow-up on this case of five months. We could take a post-op CBCT, and you can see the phosphosilitate, this phosphosilitate material takes a little bit more time to turn over, but I kind of like that. That's the same type of ideology, but you'll see some older cases that I have that actually have more of a sinus floor. So another case, let's talk about doing this more guided fashion. So guided vertical sinus lifts. So using digital technology, now we have some new scanners. This is a, an, a Rayden scanner that actually incorporates facial scanning. CareStream outside has the same scanner, the 9600, incorporates the facial scanning so we can actually plan these cases. And on bigger cases, this is obviously going to be more important. Uh, that's a new scanner that I just started playing with about a year ago called the 3DISC. Should be out any day. Interesting scanner, a little lightweight. The Medit scanner outside, excellent scanner as well. So the technology is here. The only thing is we're still using some old technology to do this. We're still using keys. And I don't like keys. I don't even like keys to get into my house. I'd rather have my phone enter the house for me. I don't like keys to my room. I like the apps and things like that. So I dropped the keys. And we've gone without keys and using an R2 guide from uh, uh, Megagen, we were able to do this now without keys. We were able to get our timing of our implant to get into the correct position. And this is going to become important when we want to load implants the same day, because we want the timing of that hex. So if we don't want to use multi-unit abutments, we want to go direct to that implant and gain that interface, we need to know where that horizontal and vertical stoppage is for our hex or octagon or whatever type of connection you're using. So we need to have these in place. And using the Sea Guide, which was truly honored to introduce to you two years ago, using the Sea Guide to have our stop, we're able to control this type of placement and use the denser burrs in that fashion in guided surgery. This was the case I showed you two years ago, if you were here, using it in the pumping motion with the Sea Guide and delivering our implants the same day, being able to incorporate that into your practice of using osteodensification and delivery fully guided, not template assisted. Delivering our final zirconia abutment, the one abutment, one time concept. And in this case, we did do a veneer graft using xenograft, as I learned from Mike Picos many years ago, and then some PRF. 
And we were able to load these crowns the same day. So this was the case I showed you two years ago, and it was just then about only a month or two old. These were the final pictures that I showed you. And this is two years later. And you can see the response. And you can see the, uh, the x-rays to confirm that we are doing extremely well. The patient's very, very happy. So the guided surgery solution is working, and we're doing very well with it. So let's incorporate that into our vertical sinus lifts. So here's a case where we have a tooth that needs to be um, extracted. So I don't toss the teeth in the garbage. If they're usable and I can use them, I'll grind them up. And Sinjana will show you more about that later today. But I like to grind teeth. I like that green dentistry philosophy. As uh, I think um, uh, Ziv, um, Ziv showed you yesterday, I was introduced to it by, by Ziv Mazur years ago. And I've been using it now for almost five years, I think it is, for about that. And it's changed my practice. Absolutely love this device. And you can come back and look at the CBCT and you can see that there's bone there. It's dent and bone, but there is bone there. So now it's time to do our guided sinus surgical. Now, I, I don't like sleeves either. I've always tried to be able to, be, to 3D print in my own office. So if I have to incorporate sleeves, it's more work for me and I'm lazy. I'm not interested. I need to get home. I'm in Brooklyn. I got to get home and see my four kids. I don't have time to install sleeves. So I like to ditch the sleeves and go sleeveless. So I built in a a floor, and I did this through the uh, R2 uh, software, actually through the Blue, uh, Blue Sky Bio software, and we built in a stopper into, this, into the guide itself, still keeping it open, and using that same pumping action, we were able to go ahead and lift the sinus the same manner. In this case, we did not need to add a graft. We had, were able to use the auto compaction. When I started early on in the case, you can see that we saw the sinus floor, but as I kept using the wider drills, I didn't need to add anything. The, the bone from the surrounding area just pushed up and filled that void for me. So I was able to get a couple of millimeters out of this, and that's all I really wanted to do was to try it, place it, place the implant the same day, and deliver it and get a good result where we can push that autogenous bone more, more apical. And so we could see that there was success on this case. We took our impressions at about eight weeks later, which is my standard protocol. And here I took impressions. This is an older case. I wasn't scanning. I like to use composite around my transfers to capture the sulcus so the tissue doesn't slump. And then we were able to deliver a final crown at just about two and a half months later. And you can see the initial and the, the post-op on the x-ray. Obviously, x-rays are not as good as CBCT, but you can see there is bone growth around the tip of that apex of that tooth, of that implant, three years later. Three years later, the other tooth on the other side had to come out, took it out, and now the tooth adjacent to it as well. We used those teeth the same way. We ground them up. But before that, we did the vertical sinus lift. And this one was free-handed. And we built bone around it, and we used the lamina membrane technique, and we used the dentin ground bone by grinding up the uh, molar and the premolar, and we surrounded that, and we had uh, really nice results using complete autogenous, trying to use autogenous as much as possible, even the PRF material for the soft tissue portion on this poncho technique, and we were able to elevate the sinus quite nicely in this case using the Nova bone, as you can see. And just a few, weeks, uh, a few months later, we're already scanning for, because this is three years later, we're already scanning because we have the ISQs in the right spot at 75 and 78, putting, placing our scan abutments and going direct towards our final using the three-shape protocol. You can invite Jonathan Abinayim up here to tell you much more about that than I can. He is the wizard of the uh, 3D. And then making our final screw retained crowns and delivering them. And then looking at this two-year post-op on this case, and we can see that the bone is still there and the bone is extremely stable. So three years from one side and two years on the other. Now well, this works. So the guided solution worked. So here's another case. We cut off the crowns, grounded the roots, placed them, grafted, came back later because I wanted to make a guide. And you can see, look at that. That looks like bone to me on a cone beam there. I'm extremely happy with that. So dent and ground bone, to me, is the way to go. Here we are placing the guide in place. We did a double guide for this. This was one that I printed off my, my Formlab printer, being able to use the, uh, the, C, the, C, uh, the telestops through a, this guide that I had just made. I allowed a little bit more water. It wasn't the exact same design, but I was just playing around to see how it would work out. And then using an R2 guide 
after we can see the nova bone going into place here, helping to continue that hydraulic lifting, pushing up that sinus floor, then using it free-handed to continue to lift the membrane, the Schneiderian membrane. And then we were able to go ahead and using a R2 guide, which I had also printed in my office, deliver the implant the same day in the exact spot that I want them to be. I wasn't planning on loading this case, but I just wanted to control it. And again, I've been experimenting more and more uh, in the posterior region with this, but I'm not a uh, total cowboy. I like to try to control my cases as much as I can and take my time and get my good results. So in this case, I did a delayed because I had lower ISQs. So here we are on the post-op, and you can see the results here, how the sinus lifted quite beautifully. Three months later, our ISQs go up, and we can start fabricating our final crowns. Now, taking a look at the post-op a few years later, look at that new sinus floor that's developed. So this works, and we have a controlled solution, but it's a two-guide solution, but it works. So how about doing this and actually loading the implant the same day? So a vertical sinus approach and loading the same day. So that, to me, was more of a challenge, because, again, I have to use these two guides, and I'm worried about the accuracy and, and getting my timing of my implant and the timing of my abutments to be in the exact spot that I want them to be so I can load. So here we are with a patient that actually presented with a, had a failed implant. It healed after a few years. You can see there is a thick membrane, so this was a slam dunk case for me to try this on. I know I have good bone. It's been there for years. So let me try to load this one. I have about five and a half millimeters. I would load that uh, confidently out of occlusion on the right patient. That's the other important part. So here we have the C guide again with no sleeve that I built in using the Blue Sky Bio uh, software, using the Telestop to control my depth, and then completing, starting the drilling sequence, elevating that membrane, using that pumping action, getting to the sinus floor, and continuing to allow that water to get up there and continue that hydro, hydrodynamic effect. And then as we check, always, to ensure the stability of the sinus floor, we do not want this sinus floor um, open. If it, we have a perforation, we'll, we'll change it around, as Michael just showed you the techniques to do that and the risk versus reward factor there. But here we can see the sinus floor. We can see the bone is there. It's being pushed up. It's there. You can witness it. Using high power magnification, we can visualize this. And then taking the Nova bone and using that same type of a concept where we can push that bone, well, continue to elevate the sinus the rest of the way. This can take us through the entire process without having to use too many extra tools. It's a really wonderful device, and it just slips on a composite handle. And I have, I don't know, 100,000 of those in my office. It always seems to be extra ones floating around. And then again, using that same technique, I know you've seen it before, there's a 50 R RPM option. Without water, Ziv taught me to go 200 RPM as well, and that works really, really well. I actually like the 200 RPM a little bit better. And we slowly continue that manipulation of that nova bone, pushing it up into the sinus cavity. Then delivering our implant again through the R2. I did have to use a sleeve on this one for, um, to control it because I was afraid it was going to shift um, as I was lowering my implant, so I did use a, a sleeve. But I am still working now, I'll show you in a moment, working on a new solution. But getting the implant in the right spot and getting the hex position in the right spot. So now, can I load this implant the same day? Well, I got my ISQ. Let's take it and let's see what it reads. I know that if I'm of a 75 and I have over 45 newtons worth of torque, there's 960 articles out there in the literature that can tell me that I can load my implant the same day. So I have an 81. And I have way over 45 on the torque and just 5 millimeters of bone. So here I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable, 83. That's pretty comfortable readings for me. So I'm going to install the zirconia abutment. I only had one problem with the zirconia abutment. I didn't like the, the emergence profile, so I had to modify it. But I tried it in. I inserted it fit perfectly. I tried in my temporary resin crown that I placed in, so I can do this, try to do this one abutment, one time concept. And it worked quite nicely. It fit beautifully. 
But then I took out the zirconia of crown, the abutment, modified it into a nicer shape. Because this was the initial shape, and that's terrible to me. So getting your lab on the same page is important. So we modified that. But we, at the same time I was modifying, I took a cone beam just to evaluate my position of my sinus floor. And you can see that I'm very nicely elevated, and I have a good amount of bone apical. So now I've modified my temporary crown. I came back to look, inspect the emergence profile, because again, I'm checking on this case to make sure everything is ideal. Normally, I wouldn't remove this in a one abutment one time concept, but I did to inspect to make sure everything is correct. There's no tissue in there. And here's the right type of emergence profile that I like to have. And this is the final zirconia crown installed. And you can see that the elevation is there and controlling the contour of abutment is there. And that's essential to long-term success. That other tooth next to it is not going to have long-term success, but this one is essential to long-term success. But the real test is to look at it on the CBCT and to see. And you can see this is now a year post-op, and we have a brand new sinus floor that's been in place. So this works. We can do this, this in a guided solution and deliver in that same manner, and that's a sagittal slicing view and the reconstruction on the side that you can see. So from my own personal studies on this, that I've been, uh, when I've been using the uh, uh, Crestal Sinus Lift with the Nova Bone together for a bit over two years, 23 cases, 35 implants placed, average height gain was 3.7 millimeter, and I had one failure. And then that failure was my own fault, and I knew it was going to be an issue. I had 10 cases of mild swelling, one case with the infection because I didn't suture it right, and that's the case that failed. So this is my experience with the denser burrs in the sinus, and it's been truly remarkable what we can do by just pushing the autogenous bone itself. So the phrase that I like to say is intensify and densify, and the drill paves the way, but osteodensification is the key to making it stay. So our patients are losing teeth at extremely interesting ways. If you look at this, this was just the other day, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. So we're going to be having to place a lot more implants. So use the right burr to place that implant so that his tooth won't fall out. And our patients are finding other ways and other sources of having their teeth extracted. So maybe we're becoming obsolete. And there's a lot of things you can do with these Nerf guns these days, too. <laughs> my kids can show you how to do this. We have a, a workshop later on today with my, my four children in the back. They're happy to show you how to use this technique. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of the Versa team. Thank you for your attention.